hopefully that's recorded. All right, because I've got something up on the screen, so I can't actually see what we got going on. We'll trust it. All right, we were looking at this this uh, simple gizmo yesterday. It was a uh, remember just a, a triangular triangular support holding a simple 30 pound or 30 kilonewton load at the end there. Um, and we were going beyond what we always used to do to get us through the statics part. Where all we did in statics was figure out what the forces were in the members and it was good enough at that. Now we're in a, uh, a portion in this, this general topic where we need to determine what materials, how much of the material, what shape of the material we need to uh, use in these structures to make sure that those loads that are in the uh, each member are, uh, are supportable by that material. We finished up uh, yesterday I believe we had just found the stress in the member uh, BC. Let's see if, uh, if I remember. That was A, B, no, that was C, right? That was B. Is that how we labeled them? B is up here. B is. So B is down here. <coughs> All right, so we had just found out, just determined what the um, normal stress was in that diagonal member BC. No reason other than we've got to start with one of them, so we started with that one. Do you remember how we defined this term normal stress? How do we find it? That's just what we finished with uh, at the end yesterday. How do we find normal stress? F over A, where that F is what force? It's that force felt down the member uh, it's the type of thing we looked at when we were looking at uh, the shear moment diagrams last year. Uh, it's the force in the member itself, along the member that it's feeling. Maybe we could have labeled that then the force in BC. We found that from a free body diagram on this point P. So that was just a, a very simple thing to do. That way we got the load tell us what the forces were in each of the members. What is that area? It's very important to use the right area. If you don't, you're not going to get the stress right. You're not going to get the rest of the design right. What was that area that we used in there? It's the cross-sectional area. This member BC is a circular member which you can tell because of the break in the diagram. It's got that kind of shape to it. That's an, uh, an engineering designation that we've got an imaginary cut through a circular member. That diameter was given as, what, 20 millimeters? So we, of course, then can find the area from pi r squared, where of course r is then uh, 10 millimeters. We came up with that, um, I believe it was 314 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. The force in the member was, uh, if I remember, 50 kilonewtons. So then we know then that the, the stress is simply the force that the, is being supported by that member itself divided by the area that is doing that supporting. Remember, this is the cross-sectional area. 
so that whatever force is in this member is perpendicular to that cross-sectional area. And so we finished up uh, just coming up with 159 megapascals. Uh, what's a pascal? What? Newton per square meter. Again, simply a matter of convenience. If you don't want to use Pascal, if you want to leave it in Newtons per meter squared, no sweat. Not a big deal. Pascal is not going to take the insult that you uh, intend for, for him to have by ignoring that. It's just a matter of convenience. But if you want to ignore it, you can. If it's if we're doing this in English units, you will most likely come across psi pounds per inch squared. And since those are English units, there's no one to honor with a special unit there. We leave it as psi. Also, as a possibility, remember we're working with some pretty large numbers here. That's why we're already to megapascal. We might see KSI, which is, remember what the K stands for there? In this case, remember we're in English units, so it's, uh, well, it actually is. It's uh, um, It's kind of a mix of SI nomenclature with English units. This is a kilopound. So a kip is a kilopound is 1,000 pounds. And if anybody can ever figure out why the abbreviation for pounds is LB, I have no idea. I have no idea where that comes from. So don't blame me for that. All right. If I remember, that's where we got to. Uh, we've just come up with this number here on, uh, on yesterday's class. At the end of yesterday's class, right? That's where we finished. All right. What we can do now that we couldn't do before is we can start to determine what material should we choose that can maintain that type of stress. Now that we are actually sizing the object, we can make sure that we get a material that will hold that stress. So if you have your book here, look and then open the back cover. If you don't have your book here, cozy up with someone who does. Introduce yourself. I know that there's a, a 200 people in here today. I already got something on the screen. Oh, yeah. That's all fun. I can, huh? Just for you at least see. Okay, I got to zoom. So I zoom here. Oh, zoom. All right. What we have in the back of the book are uh, the average mechanical properties for typical engineering materials, which are just what you might think they might be. Aluminum, cast iron, steel, we go all the way down into concrete and wood. The, the types of things you would expect us to build stuff out of. This is mostly a class on, on how to build structures that are strong enough to remain static, to not accelerate at any time. And so we can start to look, um, this, this first page I have, uh, happens to be in the SI units, so if we go down to the lower page, if I can do it, then we have the very same materials just now listed in SI units. And if we go over, we start to think, see things like the yield strength. We'll define these specifically shortly, but you can start to see that now we have some limits we can start looking at. We know we need to have a material that can withstand at least 160 megapascals. So we don't want to pick any material 
that these numbers, even when we're not sure what these numbers mean, you can tell by the wording we got to stay within here somewhere. We certainly don't want to start thinking about any materials where the uh, the shear numbers we have here are well above the shear numbers on this chart here. For example, way down here we have a 90 for uh, tension. This material is in tension. So we would not want to make this out of plastic reinforced glass, fiberglass of some kind. It just, we, we, we could not make it. We'd have to use a lot more of the glass than we want to in the design here. For some reason, we are limited to a 20 millimeter diameter uh, as part of the design. So we need to pick a material where only 20 millimeters of that material will be able to support this 50 kilonewton load. Any other material below that is going to fail. Those are the type of decisions we're going to start making this term that we never made before. So if you uh, take a quick look in the book, uh, let's see, maybe steel, these kind of, these, this, this object sort of looks like it's steel anyway. Steel, we're talking about uh, yield strength, somewhere around 200 megapascals. That's a little bit above here. Uh, when you go to design these type of things, depending upon what the use is, you might want to put, pick a material that's got a, a stress limit, maybe double of what you expect to there to be in there, so there's a factor of safety. That allows for uh, assumptions you need to make that sometimes approximate answers. It allows for manufacturing irregularities that, that occur, whether it's the production of the steel or the production of the member itself. You want a factor of safety in there. You don't ever want to pick a material that just barely gives you what you need. You're too close to the edge there. You're too close to the chance of failure. Remember, these numbers that are in here are statistically determined. They take a thousand samples, and they uh, might these might be the published averages, which means there are going to be a lot of them that are above that, and a lot of them that are below that. Maybe you'll get a little more for your money, but maybe you'll have too little for what you paid for. You're going to be under, so you need to build in a factor of safety, and we'll use that kind of thing as we go along here as we go through this. So that was our first calculation of the shear stress in that member. We're not done with that member yet because as you look at it, you know that uh, we looked at it, we looked at, and let's see this thing supposed to show up there on the screen. Why isn't that working? And then what's this for? It's not going to work. Okay, I don't know what I can put on here. All right, we're having technical difficulties. We're not going to belabor the point here. Back to the document camera. We looked at the shear stress uh, along this cylindrical part through the center of it. We just took a, a diamond across there, figured out what the area was, figured out what the stress is through that piece. There might be somewhere in this piece where there's actually less area available for the support and we need to concern ourselves with that. If you look up at the piece up here, it's, uh, it's a larger piece. There's, there's generally more structure available there because that piece is now 40 millimeters in one direction and only 20 millimeters in the other, but then it's got that big hole through it. So we need to look also at other places like that to determine are those places where there's actually less material available for the support of this 20 kilonewton, or sorry, 50 kilonewton load. So if we look at that, at that one piece up there,
we've got this sort of this sort of setup there. Jake, you sure you want to quit technical freelance sketching and won't be able to do amazing things like this at the board? It's true. We had the uh, the cross sectional area here that we've already calculated and what the stress is across that area. It's also true though that this area has to withstand that 50 kilonewton load just as this piece down here does because this 50 kilonewton load goes through the entire piece. We don't need to actually recalculate the stress there, but we do at least need to see what the area is. If the area is less than it is here, then the stress is going to be greater at that point. The load will be the same. If the area goes down, the stress goes up. That's a pretty easy area to recalculate. We have a piece that's... Uh, what is it? Uh, it's that's 40 by 20. Is that right? Is that how you read it in that diagram? <coughs> Bless you. But we've taken out a materi some material for the hole. This is a uh, 25 millimeter hole itself. So we have to subtract from that how much area is in the hole uh, taken up by the hole, which is 25 meter millimeters by 20 millimeters. Is that how you read it? Is that how you see it in the diagram? If we uh, Maybe if we look at this in perspective. That's terrible. We're not going to work with that. We're going to have to wait to the end of technical freehand sketching to handle that one. Anyway, what, what we're looking at is this uh, just the cross sectional area. Because now this still needs to withstand that 50 kilonewton load, just like uh, the main member itself did. How much area is available with this portion? We had 314 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. Yeah, Jake. Just half of it? Like that. Well, you can do just one of those holding 25 kilonewtons, half the load, because the other half's over here, or you can do both the areas holding the whole 50 kilonewtons. It doesn't matter, it's the same number. What area I have calculated here is the total area here, so I can compare it to the total area there to see if we have more material or less material in support right there. Nope. 300 squared? Three, 300 millimeters squared, or as we already know from yesterday, that's 300 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. We actually have a little bit less material there than we did down the length of the member through the center. So this becomes a greater concern because there's more normal stress in that area than we had down through the middle of the member. And you need to check that at all the other places as well. The other end of this bracket uh, tends to look very much the same and uh, so you're, you're not going to be concerned about that. But on 
you also then have to go to each of the other members as well as the attaching points themselves, which also have to be picked out of some engineering material and designed to an appropriate uh, area. And so this very simple problem that we dashed off in a few minutes in statics last year now becomes a much more involved engineering problem, as all things would, because all of these things need to be engineered just as much as any of the others. <clears throat> there are other concerns beyond just what the stress is. This is, if you remember, a member in tension. If you look at the, the chart in the book, you'll notice that all of the materials have values for tension and values for compression. For many of the materials, these numbers are just the same. For example, this first number is aluminum. It's the same in tension as it is in compression. As are most of the engineered metals, the alloys, uh, copper, magnesium, and steel alloys, titanium alloys. Um, when you look down at some of the other ones, give it a second to focus, you see that some of these numbers down here are very different. For example, it's hard to get the whole thing on the chart. This is the value for wood in tension very much lower than this value here, which is wood in compression. Very same thing we talked about yesterday, that wood in general is terrible in tension, but excellent in compression, which is why the, the deck you might build this summer, you put wood posts there. It's easy to get, it's easy to work with, and it's very good in compression, so you would use that for your support posts um, on your on your deck. But you wouldn't hang the deck from an upper story using wood uh, wood supports because wood is so bad in tension. One tenth the strength in tension that it is in compression. So we also need to look at this bottom member and what kind of compressive stress is in it. And then make sure it too is, uh, we choose an appropriate design for it too. We already have a design area specified from this problem. What we don't have though is a, a particular material chosen. So what's the stress in that horizontal piece? And don't forget there's uh, a couple possibilities. Notice that this piece is rectangular in cross section through the main part. At this end, it maintains that same cross section but now has a hole through it again. At the other end, it divides out into a Y-shaped yoke of some kind, so there's actually more material at this end than there is at the far end, so you need to look at all of those parts, all of those places, to determine what the stresses are in those pieces. So uh, just for a quick practice on your part, determine the normal stress in that member AB, both through the rectangular center and what the stress is over here where the pin has been uh, put through to hold the two pieces together. Just do that wheel real quick.
already know what the force is in that piece, but there's a different area at each of the two points we're talking about, even down at the farther piece. Remember to pay attention to in these problems and make sure you document it on your work, whether we're talking about tension or compression at any one spot. I remember the load in there was 40 kilonewtons. cross-sectional area through the center here. <clears throat> these, are, these are fairly simple engineering drawings, but uh, more involved than we ever had to look at in statics last fall. by 50 millimeters squared through that rectangular center part. And then remember we need to convert it to meters. Remember you have to square that conversion factor because the unit is squared itself. the same units we had back here. stress yet through the center part? Like, don't give it to me. Check with someone else. See if you agree. Check with Doobie. She's the fastest of all of you. Always has been. Obviously, there's going to be less area down here at this end A. All right, what do we have for the normal stress in the center of the member AB? DJ, what do you have? at 26.7 megapascals. Anybody agree with that? I don't. 12 pascals? I, no, I don't agree with that either. There's three things I need to hear on this type of number. I need, of course, the magnitude. I agree with the 26.7. What else do I need? Okay. Units. We're already struggling with that. Is it megapascals or is it kilopascals? I have that it's megapascals. Be careful with this. You mess that up, that's a factor of a thousand that your company is either going to overpay for or you're going to under-engineer the, the, uh, the object. 
the structure. We okay? Is that what? Frank, that's what you got. Did you get the 26.7 megapascals? Pat? Now you're okay? Okay. Be very careful with these units. We're going to be working with some very big numbers and some very small numbers in this class. And they have to be right. You can't be within a factor of a thousand and count that as okay. Now, pay attention. Because I said I need three things with these kind of numbers. I only have two. I have the magnitude and I have the units. What's missing? I need to know whether it's compression. This is almost a vector. This is like a one-dimensional vector. We need to know is this compression or tension. This is in compression. Uh, two ways that's typically designated in, in this, this uh, subject. You can either just write compression or you can put a minus sign. Uh, I have trouble with that because it's just easy to forget what the, what's minus and what's plus. Whereas you, when you write compression, there's no question that that material is, uh, this is a compressive stress we're calculating here. If this is made of steel, that's not a concern. We've already seen from the tables that for the most part the stress, the, the uh, ultimate stress of these materials is the same in tension and compression. But we'd have to look at that uh, for other types of materials. All right. Um, okay. So let's uh, uh, let's move on to uh, another part of this design that we need to worry about as long as we're okay with this. Before I clear the board. All right. It's a fairly straightforward calculation. However, as we're seeing, there are little things that you can get in there, uh, either unit problems, direction problems, if you're not paying attention to whether it's tension or compression. Um, also, you need to make sure that you calculate the right, the correct area in any of these. Another type of part we have to look at, for example, if we look at the pin that's in up at the, uh, the corner C, the pin itself. We have a 25 millimeter diameter uh, that symbol is, is, is often used in designate diameter, 25 millimeter diameter pin, and it's got a contact with the member CB, uh, if you remember it's, that's in tension, so there's a 50 kilonewton force on that pin from the member CB that it's supporting. It's attached to the wall with the bracket that must be pulling back some force itself. Should, uh, should be pretty apparent by how much it has to pull back as well. 50 kilonewton. There's a little bit of a, a couple formed here, but it's not significant. It may be part of why at some of the other brackets, for example, the one down at uh, point A is a U-shaped bracket, so it helps eliminate the couple that's formed by these two offset forces. But that's probably not very much to be of great concern. What is of greater concern is the fact that this pin 
if we imagine a cut across here, we've got the 50 kilonewton load being exerted by the member BC there. What's resisting that load at this imaginary cut? but the ability of the material to withstand shear. And that shear must be 50 kilonewtons itself if it's going to withstand a 50 kilonewton uh, shear that uh, is in the pin. This is a very, very different form of stress on that pin P, uh, sorry, pin C, than we had inside the member CB itself. That was a normal stress. This is a shear stress. Remember what the symbol is for shear stress? What? Tau. Tau. You need to start getting used, used to these different symbols. Uh, if you want, put a little C on it there because we have other places where there's shear stress we need to be concerned with, so you need to make sure you're keeping all these things straight. How is it defined? How do we find, find the shear stress? Sure, check your notes. That's why we keep them. It's the shear, the load being resisted, divided by the area doing that resistance. Very similar calculation to what we just had in the normal stress. It's just a different force goes into it. But it's still that cross-sectional area that is resisting that force. So we, uh, we know what the shear stress is. It's 50 kilonewtons. And the area is that cross-sectional area, pi r squared, where the radius is one half of that diameter, 25 millimeters. So calculate that real quick. Anybody have the area? So we can double check that. Four ninety one times ten to the minus six meters squared. That's good. So that's all similar units to what we had before. So whatever that calculation comes out to be, we'll uh, we'll know <coughs> what units go with it. DJ, what do you have? Hundred and two megapascals. Is that sufficient for the answer? For this problem, and specifically for this material, steel. Direction makes no difference. It's an isotropic material, meaning that its properties are the same in all directions. That's not at all true with wood. Because of the grain that grows in wood, the properties can be very different across the grain than they are along the grain. Which is why it's always very important when you're building something, 
Well, you don't even think about it because when you go to buy a two by four for building a structure, it's always with the grain running along the the uh, uh, along the, uh, the the board. It'd be a little difficult to get an eight foot board with grain running perpendicular to it because you need an eight foot in diameter tree. There aren't many of those left, so it's partly the length. But as we'll see in uh, starting in just a couple weeks, bless you, uh, it's very important that for most of the structural uses of wood that the grain actually run along the length of it to, to do what it needs to do. So we don't have a directional component on this, not with the steel and not with the shear in this case. So the answer of 102 megapascals is sufficient. Not so with the normal stresses. We need to know whether we're in tension or compression with each of those calculations. Now, like, member CB, that could go through a shear stress, could it? The, the member itself? Right, that could right? uh, Well, not, not, uh, not quite true. If you look at the ends, there, there might be some, some shearing here as, as uh, this part is being pulled this way but this part is all trying to pull it back. Uh, there might be a worry of shear failure back across that, where the eyelet itself just rips out. There's even another concern we need to look at in that area too as well, that we'll get to in just a second. So, uh, as you're learning as we get as, as you get you're only in your second year here as you get through the four years and then maybe graduate school and a couple years experience it gets more and more involved the more you go along which is which is why not any dope on the street can become an engineer this is an example of what we have here of what's called single shear there's only a single place where we're worried about the shear occurring, we don't have to look at any other part of it. We do have a place, uh, in fact there's more than one, where we have a pin in double shear. If you look down at pin A, same diameter pin, probably uh, picked cut from the same stock material that pin C was, there's, there's a, always an engineering advantage, a cost advantage, an efficiency advantage. If you've got a bunch of pins in a thing, if they're all exactly the same, it makes manufacture a lot easier. You don't have people putting these things together and they have to select specific pins for each one. They can just grab a pin and put it on and it makes mass production a lot easier. So as we look at pin A, it's got the same diameter as C did. But remember now that we have the member AB in compression. <coughs> so we had, uh, what was it, 40 kilonewtons. 40 kilonewtons coming from the member AB there which must be resisted by the contact with the bracket itself. And all other things being equal, we know that those two forces being supported by the bracket, or, or, or being supported by the pin because of the bracket, these must be 20 kilonewtons each. So you can immediately tell that the shear in the pin A is going to be much less than was the pin in shear C. The load is less, 
Uh, actually, sorry, that we don't want 40 kilonewtons there, do we? We want 20 kilonewtons because we have the air that those forces being supported over two places. So we have the same area supporting half the load. You can also look at it as the whole load being supported by twice the area, and you get the same number either way. So we have a center portion of pin C, uh, sorry, pin A. in double shear. And how much stress is being felt by pin A? for this shear because whatever supports that shear is going to support this one by more than enough. But it may be cheaper for you to just make all the pins out of the same stuff even though you're well over the support criteria for this pin based on this concern over here. But you have to look at each of the pins um, individually. So that's an example then of double shear. There's also a big concern uh, in the design of what's going on here at the pin B. This one's a bit more complicated than the other two because there's a lot more going on here at pin B. <clears throat> Just to help, I'll draw in uh, perspective there. The diameter of that pin is the same. You can see it up here in uh, this diagram that the pin A is, uh, I'm sorry, pin B is also 25 millimeters in diameter. But we have several other things going on. We have the member CB coming down in the center. Then we have the, uh, the, the Y-shaped yoke of AB. And then we also have the hanger for the weight itself. All of those are exerting forces on that pin B at different places. So we've got this center section where the load is coming in from the, uh, the member BC. So maybe I'll draw it. Uh, coming in like that. Remember, BC is in tension, so as the pin pulls down on BC, 
BC pulls back up on pin B. Then we have this uh, double yoke. Of, uh, of the member AB. So maybe I can draw that like, uh, remember that's, that's a horizontal thing, so I'll put those two there maybe. Always somewhat difficult to do things in three dimensions. Remember there is a, as a, an angle here of that below the below the horizontal. And then we have the the uh, hanger itself holding 30 kilonewtons but it's doing so over two places. So we might draw those like that. Maybe that's the best we can do with that, that sketch. Is that a bit of what everybody sees in there and going on at pin B? And so at each one of these interfaces between the loads, we need to figure out what the shear is. You need to do each one of those to determine where the concern is. We already had a limit of something like 102 megapascals on one of the pins. We need to make sure that one of these places is not a greater concern. Just for illustration, we'll uh, take a look at this bottom one down here. just that end piece that has a fifteen kilonewton load there and we'll throw in the twenty kilonewton load there so we're looking at uh, at not this interface, but this third one, third one here. And there must be a shear across that face that withstands that load. If that's 20 kilonewtons, this is 5 kilonewtons, then you should be able to do a fairly quick calculation to see that the shear must be 25 kilonewtons back there. Again, this uh, happens to form a 3, 4, 5 triangle. So the shear stress at that point is the 25 kilonewtons over the cross-sectional area that's withstanding that shear, which was the same for as it was for all the other pins. stress expected there something like 51 megapascals still well less 
Then the 102 we found in the first pin we looked at, I think it was pin, uh, pin C we looked at first. But as part of the engineering design, you had to decide, should we go with a smaller pin here and save some on material? Or is it better to have all the pins be exactly the same material and, and just not have to worry about it? Mostly it would depend on whatever the structure happens to be and probably depends on how many of them you're making. If you're making millions, it's probably worth it that all the pins are the same and you just don't fret with that concern and worry about other things. If you're only making, if this is a custom job and every part of it is custom made, then maybe each of the pins should be custom sized for the particular load they need to stand. So we have one other quick uh, type of thing. We'll have to look at this on Friday to finish up this problem. And then we can start on to uh, other parts of it. We have one more type of stress to actually look at with uh, with this example. All right, so <clears throat> you might want to, if you don't want to carry your book every day, you might want to at least photocopy the inside back cover so you have these numbers with you. We're going to be dealing with those numbers a lot. Um, if, uh, well, we don't need them yet, but you might want to later do the inside cover too.